One of the things that happens every single time you look at a market, and in particular when you look at a volatile market like Bitcoin and like crypto, is how surprising it is the way emotions change and shift. The fundamentals stay the same, but people's perception of them change radically. And with those emotions, fear and greed, uh, the entire crypto market goes up and down. And we, we, you know, we think about this as the bull market and the bear market, and the 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 absolute extreme differences between the emotions. Um, how on one day it looks like the industry is dead, everything is hopeless. People start writing about how Bitcoin is dead, and um, how. At the, just some days later, because the prices have started to rise, uh, everyone is counting their chickens before they hatch and expecting that they're going to get rich. And this is something that we've seen happen again and again and again. But it doesn't just happen uh, on its own. There are stories that are associated with this. So right now we're in a really interesting period. We are bang on schedule for a Bitcoin bull market. And what we are waiting to see is what are the stories that are going to lead this, this market. And something remarkable has been happening over the last week. A shift as dramatic as the emotions of crypto traders has been happening in U.S. politics. Uh, up until just a week ago, it was clear that the entire uh, array of forces of the U.S. government was arrayed against crypto. The SEC was arrayed against crypto. Congress was arrayed against crypto. Um, and uh, then just a few days later, because one presidential candidate introduced the idea that perhaps crypto was becoming a political issue and saw the opportunity to bring in new voters by appealing to Bitcoiners, by appealing to crypto voters, everything's changed. Suddenly, the Ethereum ETF that wasn't going to be approved is going to be approved. Suddenly, laws are being passed in Congress uh, to allow um, for regulating the market. And suddenly, we have presidential candidates who are talking about crypto. And with this, there is a huge opportunity because uh, one of the primary things that has been holding Bitcoin back and crypto back, not in terms of what they can actually deliver on a fundamental level, but in terms of how they are perceived by people, has been the question of whether or not uh, we're going to see, in particular, the U.S. government crack down on it. And it's... And so now we have potentially just in time for a, a bull market, an opportunity here where we're, we, we, we're already seeing the, the government changing its tune. This will impact every single, inv every single investor's perception of the space. And um, we're heading into an election this November, just months away. And this could be a major topic of conversation. It could be a major talking point in the election. And that is a type of maturity and a type of advertising that Bitcoin and crypto has never had before. So I wanted to create an opportunity, a space here today to discuss, should Bitcoiners be thinking about voting for Trump? Is it time to turn this into a political issue? Um, we have with us uh, Paul Pui, who is the CEO of one of the most popular Web3 wallets, Edge Wallet. Um, I'm adding now um, Simon Dixon, and we're going to be adding a few other guests. And um, we also, at the end, will be talking to Tap Protocol, who are building on Bitcoin. Um, and um, what I want to do is I want to provide guests with an opportunity here um, and, I, and I've asked people to who, who have clear and strong uh, opinions uh, on, uh, on the, the intersection of Bitcoin and politics uh, 
to come and express their views on this matter. So, um, joining us, uh, and I'm going to start with, with you. Joining us is, is, is Bruce Fenton. And Bruce, you, uh, I'm going to ask you to start because you actually have run for political office in the U.S. You've been involved in Bitcoin for, I think, well over a decade now. And you're one of the most politically active Bitcoiners that I know. And so the question that we have before the house today, right, before this space, is should Bitcoiners be voting for Trump? I'm going to ask you to concisely provide the best argument you have for your view, and then I'm going to invite others to rebut. And, uh, and, 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 and the way I want to run this space is a bit different from the way we, we typically do it. I want this to be very clearly a debate, and so I'm going to set some ground rules. Um, I'm going to ask for speakers to be concise, for speakers to make um, to be to feel free to make the most extreme version of the argument, and if they want to rebut something that they're hearing, to raise their hands, and I'll um, I'll ask them to to speak. All right, Bruce, floor is yours. Hey, thanks. Um, the answer is yes. I think we should. <clears throat> I'm reluctant about it. I'm not a MAGA guy. I'm not a uh, particular Trump fan. There's a lot of things I'm skeptical about. He didn't drain the swamp, like he said. I'm skeptical about his ability to do that. I'm downright furious about his handling of COVID and not firing Fauci. I'm concerned about his comments about taking guns away from people. But am I going to vote for him? Absolutely, heck yes, definitely 110%. Because the alternative is either a couple people who are completely unelectable or the other front runner who is a very, very, very dangerous dementia patient. And at the top of the list, I think increases the risk of World War III, which is you know beyond the horrors that any of us can hopefully imagine. And even if that isn't the case, he still has all kinds of other issues with the economy and centralization and authoritarianism, totalitarianism, uh, completely incapable of doing the job, national and international embarrassment. And he represents a woke ideology that I think is evil. So there isn't really much choice. This is what you've left me with. I'm going with Trump. All right. And now for a, a different view, uh, Paul. I'm going to give you an opportunity to rebut. Yeah, so I uh, have utmost respect for Bruce. So he's actually an advisor for, for Hedge, but I think this is where we, we differ a bit. Um, fundamentally, I, I have exactly the same concerns as Bruce, but I think those concerns will actually um, manifest themselves in not getting crypto great support with Trump and his administration. As Bruce had said, Trump made a bunch of promises. Um, he talked about the promise of draining the swamp. Trump elected, oh not appointed, got Scott Gottlieb to the FDA, who now who, who now works, I believe, for Pfizer or other big pharma industries. Steve Munchen, former Goldman Sachs, um, was appointed. Uh, CEO for Exxon Mobil was appointed. And this is Trump's promise to drain the swamp by electing some of the biggest uh, corporate influencers into his cabinet. It, it, it made no, absolutely no sense. And so he can make these promises to the crypto industry, but who would he end up appointing to the SEC? You know, could it be someone from big banking at the end of the day? We don't really know that, but at least his, we know that his history has shown that the promises don't really fall in line. And while he might seem like the better choice, I don't think it's a choice that's good enough. Um, and for the first time, we actually have a, an official running that is incredibly pro-crypto and achieving a fairly high amount of, uh, of follow, a fairly high following within the polls with Kennedy. And he ticks off not every single box. And, and a lot of people like to point out how he's not perfect. And I think no politician is perfect, i.e. Trump, Biden. But he seems to have an absolutely core interest in crypto, not the, well, it's the cool thing. All the cool kids are talking about it. I want to get their votes. Let's go and tack it onto our platform. And if you listen to Trump talk about crypto, you absolutely get that impression. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want to say he likes it. He's a dollar guy. He is a dollar maximalist, and he's mentioned that in previous talks. But he knows that he needs the crypto ecosystem, and he needs their vote. One thing that also concerns me is, you know, we are a very divided country. And I think Biden and Trump have contributed to that. With Trump backing crypto, 
you end up getting this, this topic that it will actually alienate the other half of the country. So while we might get some pro-crypto sentiment, we alienate people that think anything Trump is for, I am against. And so, as opposed to hiring someone, or not hiring someone, but electing an official that actually wants to unify the country and actually has some policy that should be able to do that. So I'm, I'm far against Trump, also against Biden, and definitely much more pro-Kennedy. Okay, so I'm trying. I, I, I I'm trying um, to add Tyler Evans as a speaker. Tyler, I see you're here, but I'm I'm struggling to add you. If you can please request to be a speaker, I'll I'll try and add you. Bruce, I'm going to give you a moment to respond to Paul. He's suggesting that um, everyone should be voting for RFK, um, and uh, and I'm going to ask you from a practical perspective, what you think is actually going to be more valuable for Bitcoiners to vote for in terms of their Bitcoin. And then I'm going to uh, 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 give the floor to Tyler because I think he's got uh, some an interesting take here. Um, so just before we get to Tyler, Tyler uh, is um, one of the uh, co-owners of Bitcoin Magazine. He's a VC in the Bitcoin space uh, running UTXO Capital. And for those of you who maybe missed it, um, over the last few days, there's been a lot of chatter about Bitcoin Magazine actually taking an active role in potentially assisting uh, or working with Trump. So maybe we'll hear a bit about that. I'll come to you, Tyler. Um, Bruce, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I like some things about RFK Jr. for sure. You know, he's spoken out against uh, a lot of the COVID insanity. He's criticized Trump rightfully on a lot of things. I think Paul's points about the, the draining the swamp are right. But to me, I mean, the, just unfortunately, and I, and I hate to say this because I wish it wasn't the truth in America, you just don't have a... Um, great chance with a third party you you basically have no chance especially now in a highly contested thing like this where you have motivated voters on both sides so unfortunately i think you're looking at like another one or two or three percent just getting on the ballots and everything it's just it's just hard it's stacked against him in every way i don't agree with him on everything i think he does have some good points and some bad points but i think it's really just the electability and you know, then there's a huge debate now after the libertarian debate last week within the libertarian party and the small L libertarians about should should libertarians support the libertarian candidate or someone else or should they support Trump? Uh, and I just go on the side of thinking that the best way to get these things done, as much as I hold my nose at the Republicans, as much as I have problems with some of the things Trump did, and as much as I really have big problems with people like McConnell and, and you know, Bush Cheney style Republicans, I think that following in the path of Ron Paul Rand Paul to some degree, Thomas Massey, these kind of people. I, th I just really think that's the best way to get things done. And now we have Trump, who actually has a real chance of getting elected, who has pledged to free Ross, back off our industry, reform the SEC, these kind of things. I think these have you know real tangible uh, chances of happening, but just a much better chance overall. All right. So thank you very much, Bruce. I think one of the ways, one of the things that's interesting is... Um, I, Bruce, Paul, Tyler, Simon, and probably everyone here, right? Uh, a, a lot of us were attracted to Bitcoin in the first place because we wanted to get away from a world where we had to care about politics, where there were uh, these hierarchical authorities, these centralized powers that had so much control over our lives. And it, it I, there was definitely a very clear libertarian anarchist streak uh, a, a, in Bitcoin from the very earliest days, and it has presented itself as an alternative to politics. And so with that, I want to introduce Tyler Evans, um, one of the publishers of Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, Tyler, given that, what's your, what, what, what is your take and, and, and why does it seem that so many Bitcoiners are starting to think about Trump as a potential candidate. Thanks, Yaga. <laughs> Good to be here. Good to see 
a lot of friends up here uh, uh, in the space. So, um, you know, I, I very much resonate with what you just mentioned that I, I got into Bitcoin because uh, it was a tool to free the money, free uh, people's financial choices and sovereignty from the control of governments and I want as little government involvement as in my money uh, as I can have. Um, sadly, you know, what we've seen over the past couple of years is a, uh, you could call it an, an all out um, regulatory war against the Bitcoin and crypto industry where uh, the government has very made very much made uh, uh, Bitcoin um, something that they care about and want to make it uh, play by their rules where they can exploit it and benefit it from it and um, surveil all the transactions happening uh, uh, to feed into the surveillance state. So uh, all that to say, I'm very much a, a pragmatist when, this, when it comes to this stuff. <clears throat> and I think the kind of uh, about face we've seen from uh, the Trump campaign on Bitcoin over the past uh, couple weeks has been incredibly positive and, and also spurred, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit of changes, it seems like, um, within the Democratic Party, um, even within the regulatory environment today. And we've seen um, kind of the baby steps of that with some of the uh, bills that have moved through the Senate recently, trying to actually lay out, lay out a reasonable framework or some rules of the road for how uh, Congress is thinking about regulating this stuff. Um, but if you're a, a pragmatist like I am, uh, I think uh, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, very, very clear to just look um, both at the, the last couple years of what the industry's lived through and <clears throat> seeing the uh, promises that Trump is making right now, uh, whether or not he'll actually deliver on those promises is something that we all need to hold him accountable on. But, um, you know, from the time I've gotten to spend with people, uh, you know, uh, uh, in uh, Trump's administration, uh, people advising him on the campaign, it, from my perspective, it, it really does see, seem um, uh, genuine to me that uh, Trump and, and, you know, the policy people around him understand Bitcoin much better than they did uh, four years ago, and <clears throat> that he's uh, sincere when he's talking about the right to self-custody and uh, how he wants to uh, limit uh, government overment, uh, intervention in this stuff generally. And I think freeing Ross is a great example of that. That would be uh, such an accomplishment for our industry uh, that was uh, such a politically motivated um, prosecution to make an example uh, out of Ross Ulbricht. So if Trump can uh, deliver on that, um, they won. And, and like Yago said, you know, uh, not Bitcoin Magazine, the company, but uh, my co-founder, David, and some other folks on our team, especially through our uh, policy institute, the, the Bitcoin Policy Institute in D.C., I've been working um, with a lot of the uh, policy people, with people in the campaign on helping them think about uh, 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 a sensible approach to um, you know, interacting with the uh, Bitcoin industry and some things that Trump could do uh, day one as president uh, across the regulatory agencies, across the uh, SEC, uh, FINRA, the CFTC, uh, some baby steps uh, that he could make to really open the doors for that dialogue and, and uh, have a much more productive relationship between our industry and, and the lawmakers in D.C. Um, that has been a, a conversation that's been entirely stonewalled for the last couple of years. So all of that gives me hope, although I don't put uh, much of my hope in, in any politician. But I think if, if you're, uh, you know, uh, just want to uh, hold your coins and um, build the future we all want, and you're a pragmatic person, uh, uh, Trump is, is the, the person you want in office uh, for the Bitcoin industry. So, Tyler, I want to, because you um, have been working with people on the campaign, um, because you know these people and you've been talking to them, I want to challenge you on this. So, three arguments, uh, specifically about Trump, right? One, this is a man who has clearly demonstrated 
in various ways authoritarian tendencies. Uh, if it's um, a sort of affinity for other authoritarians and strongmen, if it's um, the uh, sort of, <laughs> let's call it muscular way uh, that he approached trying to uh, uh, disrupt the elections, and if it's the actual policies and, 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 and approach that he's um, frequently discussed in terms of the, ki the kinds of, you know, strongman um, authoritarian uh, approach that he would take to politics. At the same time, he seems to be a man who has a very, very short attention span. Um, and um, a lot of people would argue he is the consummate politician. He will say whatever he thinks will be popular. Um, whichever, whatever he sees is getting him applause, and where he sees things are getting him applause, he will uh, double down and say them again and again. But that obviously means that to a great extent, um, his beliefs, his actions, his words are at the whims of the crowd, right? So short attention span, authoritarian tendencies, and a tendency to go with whatever the crowd is supporting at the time, right? Three common arguments against Trump. So how can we trust or why should we trust um, that a vote for Trump is actually a vote for Bitcoin? Well, I think, I think like I mentioned, we need to hold, hold him uh, responsible for delivering on those promises. Uh, but I, I think uh, all those concerns you, you raise are a valid, valid ones. Um, uh, but you're very much picking between the lesser of, of two evils here. And I also think that, uh, you know, Trump is, uh, kind of represents this perspective because he is a businessman. He is a capitalist. Uh, he did, uh, deliver on rolling back one of the largest, uh, tax cuts and a strong economy and all sorts of pro business stuff. And he's, he's a pragmatic, uh, deal maker too. So I don't want to pretend like, uh, you know, his, his, um, uh, change of heart when it comes to Bitcoin isn't at all due to the popularity he sees, the donations he thinks he can uh, get for his campaign because of this uh, policy position, the you know popularity that he thinks uh, that it will attract. Um, I think he's a pragmatist on on all these things, but ultimately he's kind of a a, 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 a capitalist pro businessman, and he sees that there's a deal, a productive partnership here. To be made, um, uh, and and uh, you know, just comparing the track record, uh, the the industry under Trump compared to the kind of all-out uh, regulatory warfare we've had from the Biden industry over the past couple of years, uh, I I agree. That there's probably much better candidates, much better champions for Bitcoin. Uh, but if you uh, want to pick the lesser of two evils, I think both the sides have kind of showed, showed their cards pretty well here. All right. So, Paul, it looks like you would like to challenge uh, Tyler on this. Yeah, Tyler kind of said it really well with uh, pick the lesser of two evils. And I think that's what the uniparty of the Democrats and Republicans want you to believe. Um, and we're falling into that trap by effectively uh, voting in Trump. We're eliminating any chance for a third party going forward in the next several decades by establishing an actual precedent that we are not in a two-party system, that opens up so many more of, it, more of the issues that we have had in the country for the past several decades. You know, and Bruce touched upon this in the sense that you know, he dislikes many aspects of Trump, not just, and he's not looking just purely at you know, the being pro-crypto, pro-Bitcoin. I know, Bruce, you stood on, on panels and challenged a lot of the government officials on, like you had mentioned, a lot of the COVID lockdowns and the insanity. Um, I don't. Ex I would not expect that to change if another pandemic got invented during the entire uh, administration of Trump going forward. And so, I think that the root of what Bitcoiners came from, and I, you touched upon this, Eden, is that it came from um, the ideology of economic and economic freedom, social freedom, and that root is fundamentally not improved with a Trump administration. I think there's very, very few instances in U.S. national policy where we actually have a chance for a third party. And this is one of the strongest ones because we have two incredibly weak candidates. These are the two weakest candidates we've had in probably the history 
no, no recorded history. And to be able to elect the third party opens up so many doors for not just crypto, but all the ideology that people have that align them with Bitcoin from back when it was invented. And I think people should remember that. It's not just, hey, let's get this one bill passed because it's pro-crypto. It's remember what the ideology was that got people excited about Bitcoin in the first place. And that goes far beyond Trump saying, yes, vote for me because I'm not going to squash crypto. And that's the thing. I, I want to make sure people have that in their mind because this is an opportunity. And we're not going to have this opportunity probably for decades again. This opportunity to finally crack the two-party system and benefit so much more from it than just Bitcoin. Well, Thanks, Paul. I, I agree with uh, a lot of what you said, Paul, and, and uh, I, I think uh, an alternative to the two-party system would be a great thing. And I also uh, will say we've been big supporters of uh, RFK from early on. We had him speak at uh, Bitcoin 2023. Uh, he was on the cover of Bitcoin Magazine. I think uh, RFK would probably be an even better, more pro-Bitcoin candidate uh, than Trump. Um, uh, whether or not he can win in, in the popular election, uh, it still seems like a long shot from my perspective, uh, but I think he would be incredibly good for uh, the industry as well. So it's good. We've got at least at least a couple uh, candidates who are coming around to the, the principles of Bitcoin here. Yes, I think that's a really remarkable, uh, it's just another remarkable demonstration of how far we've gone, right? The, the, the big highlight of um, how far we've come in the last cycle was the adoption of Bitcoin by a nation state, El Salvador. The <laughs> potential high watermark uh, for this particular cycle is the United States. And so, you know, <laughs> Bitcoin's ambition and what it is able to achieve and its maturity is growing exponentially even now. Um, that said, uh, it's, there's a certain irony in uh, me hosting this talk because I'm not American um, I don't have the right to vote in the US and I wouldn't vote probably even if I did so Simon and Wayne have joined us I'm going to come to you guys in a moment Wayne I, I see that you're you've raised your hand um, but um, I want to provide a little bit of framework here and maybe you guys can touch on what I'm about to say for me personally, there's a certain sense of embarrassment in even being the one hosting this conversation. The, the, the power of Bitcoin for me in my life personally is self-sovereignty. The ability for me to basically take my financial life off the grid, to be less impacted or unimpacted by... Um, the whims of various authoritarians and politicians and, and nation states. And yet, I myself, if I did have the right to vote in the US, would find myself very, very tempted to vote for basically a person who I see as a caricature of the deterioration of our institutions and our political system, which, which is Trump. And the reason is, if we can... Um, release Bitcoin from a lot of the challenges, uh, the regulatory challenges that it has, um, it will we'll find it in the hands of so many more people, we'll find it so much easier to transact, and we'll, we'll find it so much easier for us to become self-sovereign. Not to mention the fact that there's very few opportunities in life that you can actually vote in such a way that it immediately increases your net value, right? Your net worth goes up based on the vote that you make. And this is one of those rare opportunities. Um, and so, <clears throat> Wayne, I'm going to come to you in a second, but actually, you're not. I'll, I'll come to you first, Wayne, because I've, I, I, I've seen your tweets on this subject. Um, and, I, and I'm interested in your view. Uh, isn't it weird and ironic? And aren't we sort of getting old and boomery now that Bitcoiners are talking about which politician we should choose? Oh. Thanks for having me on stage. Uh, you know, to answer your question, I don't think so at all. You know, even though Bitcoin is like, you know, a peer-to-peer, censorship-resistant, decentralized network, all that stuff, we still all live in the real world. And what politicians do and what governments do and what tax policy is and what kind of license you need to run a Bitcoin mine and, and uh, whether or not a bank will give you a bank account, all of that stuff matters to all the millions of people who... 
uh, who hold Bitcoin. So I think it's, you know, uh, it's, it's a nice to think that we are above politics, but nothing is above politics. You know, any, any place where there is, you know, human interactions, um, politics is going to be, and, and politics and government and law and everything else is going to be a, a driving force. Um, you know, for me, the choice couldn't be clearer. You know, the, the Democrats have been against Bitcoin very, very strongly since, since as long as I can remember. And, uh, you know, it really kicked into, uh, into overdrive with uh, Elizabeth Warren's sort of ascendancy in the Biden administration. And, you know, when, you know, I don't like Trump that much either in some cases. In some cases, the guy's hilarious. Um, I don't think he's nearly as bad as his detractors make him out to be. And that's just really a statement more of the uh, extreme language uh, that's used, uh, you know, around him on, on all sides. But when you vote for a president, you're not just voting for an individual person. You're really voting for a team of people. And it has been very clear for a very long time that Republicans in the United States, some of them will support Bitcoin and crypto, and they want a... Uh, uh, they favor a rules-based society where the rules are clear and they apply equally to everybody. And the Democrats have opposed crypto and they favor a society where you have very strong referees who can adjust the rules and change them to help right the wrongs that they see uh, in the world. And the list of things that have happened over the past couple of years that um, have been harmful to people who hold Bitcoin and the, the industry in crypto is enormous. Um, you know, a lot of people have had their bank accounts uh, shut off, have, it, I don't want to get into a big long list. There's a big long list. You guys can check my Twitter feed if you want to see it. I just retweeted it. Somebody else pulled together a fantastic list. But for me, uh, it couldn't be clearer uh, we have an opportunity to vote for a team who is going to have a pro-crypto agenda. I think that, you know, all this stuff about Trump being an authoritarian and ending democracy, I think that's all bullshit, to be honest. And uh, I am emphatically going out there and trying to draw as clear a line as possible. Um, during the last election cycle, the last two election cycles, the presidential election and uh, congressional election, uh, people in our industry, people in Washington, D.C. who represent our industry, were trying to make crypto not partisan. And they were not speaking up because they feared the backlash of having crypto and Bitcoin become a partisan issue. And I was very, very much against that. I was loudly against it publicly, and I was very loudly against it uh, privately behind the scenes with folks. And uh, to me, it was clear what was going to happen. And I think that now that that fear of trying to make crypto a partisan issue is behind us because the Democrats chose to make crypto a partisan issue and to really try to kill the industry, um, that they're finding their courage and their ability to speak. Um, I've been kind of a bad cop. My role in all of this is just kind of going out there and saying the things that other people wouldn't say. I don't think that that's necessarily the best path forward for everybody. I think that if you're a Democrat, uh, by the way, I never gave two shits about Democrat versus Republican until I got involved in this industry and bad things started to happen. So I'm definitely not a partisan. I voted for Democrats in my life. I voted for Republicans in my life. Um, so I, you know, I don't really care about politics outside of, of, of this issue. But if you're a Democrat and you want to and you, you want to support Democrat candidates and you want their party to turn change their policy and turn them around, I would say that you, I would encourage you to go out and say to your um, your elected officials at every level and just say, hey, look, crypto and uh, Bitcoin are issues that are very important to me. And I'd like to vote for you, but I don't think I can if you guys continue to go down the path that you've gone down. And uh, hopefully, I think we'll end up in a place where it's a nonpartisan issue to support our industry. 
I think we're a very long way away from that. And the thing that I think needs to happen, it might sound harsh, but the Democrats need to pay for their bad decisions. And not only through uh, losing elections will they learn and actually change. Thanks, Wayne. So, Simon, I'm going to come to you soon because I think you've got a very different view from pretty much everyone we've heard up until now. But one of the really interesting and important things that Wayne mentioned is the team. Ultimately, um, the my, my view is that the U.S. president himself has relatively little power and certainly little time to concentrate on any particular issue. However, he does pick and choose an administration. And so, Tyler, I'd like to come back to you since you've been talking to some of the people who would be part of this team. And if you can maybe give us a little bit of color on who you think the team would be and why there's any reason to have faith in them. You know, I don't have any uh, uh, secret insight here that I, I don't think is already um, uh, circulating on the, the Twitter um, uh, thread rumors here uh, in terms of who the policy team is going to be. But uh, uh, to your point, Wayne, I think you're 100% right that uh, Trump, Trump has a short attention span like we've already discussed. But what you're really voting for is a team and, and him putting uh, smart people in place at these different agencies uh, who are going to have a sensible approach to this stuff. And, you know, one, one name that's been floated uh, a lot um, for different roles, we'll see exactly where he ends up, but uh, it's Vivek, uh, obviously a big fan of um, Bitcoin, uh, someone who has been supportive both as a presidential candidate and since then, um, uh, even most recently, I, I got to chat with him a little bit in, in person in Puerto Rico about a month or two ago, uh, where he was going to a Bitcoin event and uh, gave a speech comparing the early Bitcoiners to the founding fathers. So, uh, you know, I think um, having a person like him <coughs> or uh, some other of these rumored names for Trump's cabinet uh, in in places at the Federal Reserve, at the Treasury, uh, heads of the different regulatory agencies, is that team of people who are really going to make the biggest difference. Uh, and it's uh, we need we need to uh, uh, have Trump really stack the team in our favor here. Okay, so now I'm going to come over to you, Simon, the only other non-American currently on the panel, um, and. Uh, my my expectation is that your view is going to be probably very different from those of the other speakers. So so how are you thinking about Bitcoin, its support uh, of particular political candidates, and also what this potentially would do for Bitcoin? Yeah, sure. I'll um I'll, I'll share a few thoughts. So so firstly, it comes from the perspective that um, Bitcoin don't care whether Trump or Biden wins. Um, because it's anti-fragile, but it will determine the journey that it goes through. Um, and so to think that U.S. politics doesn't affect us all and won't affect the Bitcoin industry it is delusional. So whether you're American or not, the only difference is uh, we get to express ideas and you guys get to vote, um, but it will impact us what you guys vote on. Um, and so, you know, that's why I think it's important to give a few examples um, I think the most important, most important thing is um, global peace. Um, if we have a policy that leads to any kind of escalation between China relations, that impacts Taiwan relations. Taiwan relations will affect whether we can manufacture ASIC chips um, and manu the, 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 the semiconductors involved in that. Um, that would be a major, major impact in the Bitcoin mining industry. Um, any kind of escalation with Iran and Russia will impact oil prices. Oil prices will impact um, natural resources policy. That will impact natural gas policy. Natural gas policy will impact um, electricity. And 40% of the hash power has been, is uh, currently, um, you know, uh, mining companies in America that exist on a capital market. Now, those capital markets in the U.S. have made commitments to... Um, increase and double their hash power over the next year. Uh, whether they can fulfill that obligation is dependent upon the supply chain uh, between these different um, inputs and the electricity costs, which then inputs tax policy. So if we ended up with some kind of tax in 
Texas, um, that would impact the direction of this hash power, whether these privately whether these publicly traded companies start investing in Africa or South Africa or Central um, Central America and you know different areas. So I didn't say South Africa, I meant South America. Um, you can represent that one, Yago. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so all of all of these things in, in as a Bitcoiner, um, you, you need to be aware of because they they will be impactful. So let's take the situation right now. So if I were an American and I wasn't really, you know, if I was just thinking from a one a one way perspective, I think it's pretty cool that Trump comes out and says all this stuff. Now you play a game of game theory. Biden has to respond, and we get better and better signals and indications. The difference is, is Biden gets to actually do it, um, but Trump gets to say it. And so Trump can keep saying things, and then Biden can keep doing things, uh, and we get to judge whether Biden can actually do it or whether uh, we'll get those 50 million crypto Bitcoin holders that actually care enough about uh, Bitcoin and crypto to actually sway their vote away from many other things they may care about. Um, so look at what's happening right now. So you've got bills that affect crypto regulations. In those regulations in America, they may define um, cryptocurrency as a crypto asset. That crypto asset means that um, you could only invest 10% of your net worth if you're a non-accredited investor in crypto. Imagine how that would change, where Americans can only invest 10% of their net worth as a non-accredited investor in Bitcoin and crypto. That changes the dynamics of flows. Um, there's also an anti-CBDC bill. That could be an anti-CBDC bill that leads to governments creating a, a GDC, a government digital currency rather than a central bank digital currency. That would be massively impactful on the Fed. The Fed, that would impact rates. Rates impact all the global central banks. Global central banks impact whether we have hyperinflation in various countries. So all, all of these things are really impactful. That will then affect Bitcoin um, in this circular state. So Bitcoin is very political. It always has been very political. It always will be very political. And Bitcoin don't care whether you vote Trump or uh, Biden in the next election towards its success, but it will certainly change the journey is what I'm thinking. But yeah, think, think where we are now. You've got um, crypto regulations with Biden. Um, you've got the anti-CBDC bill. You've got the end the Fed bill. Uh, combine all those together and you could have something really good, really bad. Um, I think it would be anti-self-custody. And then for Trump comes out and said the best scripted, whoever wrote the, the script for Trump, it was brilliant. You know, anti-CBDC, uh, Elizabeth Warren cronies, uh, self custody. Everyone has the right to their own property. You know that's the that's the American dream. That's the that's what uh, we want. Uh, whether we whether we get that in the end or is, is a completely different thing. Um, but if I were voting, I'll always pick a business person over a, a, potent, a political politician, a professional politician. Um, and I think Biden's track record versus what Trump could do next. And I think it's also important to say Trump was very anti-Bitcoin when he was in the office, but it was really less relevant then. He was doing this job, which is to protect the dollar. Uh, and protecting the dollar was, you know, kind of where Bitcoin was at that time. It wasn't as significant in terms of stable coins. It wasn't as impactful in terms of ETFs. Um, while there was a massive entrepreneurship you know, startup culture in America around Bitcoin business. It's always been a very big uh, sector there. Um, Bitcoin is a completely different beast in this election. And, and that's the reason why everyone's talking about it right now. So I find it hard to judge him on previous. Um, but if he were to free Ross, I think that's an awesome thing. He's told Ross Ulbricht that he'll do it. Ross is now ex um, expecting it. Now, Biden could just do it and win the vote there. And that's the type of cat and mouse game I think we should be playing right now in order to try and get the best uh, for our sector and for our industry. So as someone who's act actively building uh, and launching you know, technology and developing projects in the space, the last point that you made is particularly resonant for me. So 
we've recently seen the US involved in arresting one of the developers behind Tornado Cash, a privacy focused protocol. That's a very, very chilling uh, act. Um, freeing Ross, I, you know, I, I know uh, Ross's mother. Um, I think she's suffered more than, possibly more than Ross from this whole thing. Um, and she's she's been a warrior fighting for his freedom. But his freedom would be the freedom for a lot of other people. Freeing Ross would, subs would send a signal um, to the legal system, uh, to the criminal system, um, and to developers that the risk of finding yourself being criminally penalized, being pursued across the globe because you're developing software is massively reduced. And that, um, for the people who are actually building this industry and for the ability for this industry to continue to grow, um, would be um, a huge impact. Um, so even beyond the initial sort of uh, ability for people to see Bitcoin as legitimized, um, and the potential increase in trade volumes, institutional interest, retail interest, right? And the ability to get Bitcoin and crypto into the hands of more and more people. There's also this additional effect of freeing up the developers. I know a lot of people who could be contributing um, and, and have stopped because of the, you know, they have families, they have children. The personal risk that they feel that they're taking on by developing privacy software, transactional software, DeFi, um, is 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 very very scary. Um, we have luckily uh, a Bitcoin DeFi protocol uh, on the panel here today, and they um, have been kind enough to sponsor this panel. And so I want to introduce now uh, Tap Protocol. Um, and I want to ask you how you guys are thinking about developing in this space, building permissionless software for Bitcoin in two ways. First of all, how you're thinking about what you're doing in terms of expanding sort of the, the um, uh, layers of, of decentralized defense around Bitcoin and how you're thinking about the potential risks involved in being a developer in this space. Yeah, uh, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, quick introduction uh, of myself. I'm uh, Benny, I'm a uh, creator, founder of Tech Protocol. And yeah, I'm super happy uh, to be here. I was never in such a big space and I'm not uh, native uh, English speaking. So if I do mis mistakes, uh, please sorry for that. Um, but yeah, generally, um, <laughs> to be honest, uh, um, me personally as a developer, I'm, I'm, I'm literally first try to not think too much about all the polit politics behind that and uh, the um uh, especially not the uh, the upcoming re regulations that we see in several jurisdictions simply because you um especially in this space that that we're operating in uh, bitcoin bitcoin ordinals uh, is is more about research right so and then you're adjusting that basically um, with the uh, with a the existing regulatory frameworks and also uh, with uh, with, um, with looking ahead to how how these uh, uh, regulatory frameworks could look like at, at the same time of course there is like a multitude of technology problems that that uh, that need to be addressed and solved there are demands from different actors uh, and and uh, when you as a developer, you you're literally like uh, trying to make everyone happy, yeah. So to say, without to make things look too Frankenstein, right? So and um, the, the the way um, th that basically answers, I would say, the, the two of your questions. So the, it's literally like uh, navigating uh, on site, yeah. And um, especially when when you have to uh, handle like all these aspects as as once uh, in, in in once right, um, it's 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 difficult, but it's also super fun. So um, that that's why I'm that's why I'm like um, rather on on the side like you know like uh, fun problem solving first right, 
uh, and then uh, then looking at, at things like how 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 does this impact potentially right the users of let's say your protocol the users of the, let's say the technology um, you're providing uh, and then you start to take care of, uh, about that but at first especially as a developer um, your job uh, is is to research right and that's what's coming first so and, and that being said I believe that uh, um, when I just heard the, the, the recent news and also this topic uh, that we're in with, with Trump I think they're in the uh, although I'm not super familiar with uh, what's going on in the United States in detail, yeah, politically, I believe that at least opened like more room for the sure. But, that but, we have. but the, the the arrest of of a developer, the first arrest of a of someone who just developed a DeFi protocol, or you know a, a smart contract protocol, the first time that ever happened happened in Europe. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, um, the, the, the point is this, when this all started with Bitcoin, Bitcoin ordinance back then, right, it was super, super simple, yeah, um, the, the, it literally started with, uh, with collectibles, and it was like, uh, everybody was, like, super bullish, uh, that, that, uh, that people could actually, like, um, uh, what's called on inscribing, yeah, art, for example, on chain, right, in, uh, in an affordable manner, right, and then moving forward, right, things got, got more and more complex and then, uh, then protocols uh, started to show up that are sitting on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on ordinals, right? They were, they were super, uh, let's say, um, limited uh, at first, right, uh, when it comes to, to their functionality. And then um, naturally, like, you know, that, that there's a, a supply-demand thing, right? So people were naturally asking, oh, uh, there's this cool protocol, can it do this, right? And then, uh, oh yeah, that's cool, but can it do that? And then we're suddenly uh, at the uh, at the fully fledged DeFi demands at some point. Yeah, that was some sometime around <clears throat> late summer last year where it, where it really like you know kind of picked up. And and uh, we ourselves addressed that um, very early on. And um, we are we are operating on L one here. That's that's super important to understand. Um, that we're trying to achieve like similar similar outcome that we have, for example, on Ethereum through <coughs> smart contracting and enabling things like DeFi without doing actually smart contracts. <coughs> and um, that's what we're doing actually right now. And um, in, within within the development of the protocol, um, we're moving step by step here, which means. Um, for example, just recently uh, there was a uh, uh, an upgrade of the protocol that enabled, um, for example, whitelisting. Uh, to to a to guy coming from from the Ethereum space and works with Solidity and things like that, um, they would say, "Yeah, so what? Uh, we can do that since since ages, right?" Yeah, true. But um, since we're operating on uh, on L one and and, uh, and and want to have that settlement right on Bitcoin, right, where the store of value is of things, right. As it's emerging from there, uh, we want to do that stuff also on L1, and um, this also means that, that you need to find a way to enable these 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 uh, functionalities, right? And um, yeah, we are basically among the first that actually uh, do that on L1. And um, yeah, I'm happy so, to so uh, yeah, I'd be, I I want to ask you about that in a moment, but first I I want to come. Actually, I, I'm glad you raised your hand, Paul, because I want to ask you. You've built one of the most popular wallets in the crypto space. You've been an entrepreneur in the space for many years, but at the same time, like all of us, or most of us, you're a human being. You've got your family life. You've got um, you know, the, 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 the business that you're trying to run, and, 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 and you've got the, all of these risks of being an entrepreneur in this space that you don't have in any other space. Uh, recently, uh, another large wallet, also from the U.S., Exodus, uh, was supposed to IPO. And um, the day of the IPO, they had um, organized everything. They had got everything ready for their NASDAQ listing. The SEC stopped it the day of, right? So for you as an entrepreneur, there's everything from the risk of them stopping your, arbitrarily stopping your IPO, all the way to potential criminal um, money laundering, et cetera, prosecution. How are you thinking about this space and how does it impact your desire or, or, or thinking about the politics. I'm glad you asked. Um, actually, this this actually branches beyond I think what people are thinking of as pro Bitcoin, pro crypto legislation. I think a lot of people 
have thoughts of, okay, can I hold Bitcoin? Um, is it a security? Are these tokens a security? You know, we hammer on um, Gary Gensler and the SEC and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth Warren's typical rhetoric um, that's anti-crypto, but we forget about other values that tend to align with the uh, original crypto ecosystem and Bitcoin, which is privacy. And so you ask that from the viewpoint of how do I feel concerned about it from a, an entrepreneur's point of view? And yes, as someone who has founded and is building a crypto wallet, but it's also very, very aligned with privacy. Um, it does concern me less about can I IPO or not, right? It, but more of like, yeah, are, are, would, would people building this type of technology go to jail? And from the viewpoint of privacy, I definitely do not hear that from any of the current duopoly, monopoly camps of our political establishment with the Democrats or the Republicans. I see a very surface level, let's create some marketing bullet points, and this is out of the Trump campaign, what are the marketing bullet points I can do to just get the vote? Without having to truly back the ideology behind it, and especially not privacy. Especially not given the fact that he has appointed people um, into positions that come from a very militant authoritarian background. In contrast, another nugget for, for Kennedy, even before he mentioned any form of backing of Bitcoin or crypto, before he spoke at Bitcoin 2023, and thank you to the Bitcoin Magazine for letting him speak at that, he had already been incredibly vocal about op opposing mass surveillance, data collection by government agencies, um, data collection by, by big tech. He's had a pro-privacy stance you know, for the sake of personal freedoms, and that, that's kind kind of why people think he's very, very libertarian in that sense. And that is a very, very big part of not just the ideology that has created Bitcoin, but also a big part of a lot of the products that are getting built. And I don't think we're going to get a shift in that without electing a president that actually has the ideology behind it, as opposed to just the marketing bullet points and a team underneath him. You know, people say, hey, you don't just elect the president, you elect the team. But the team underneath him is, is not going to have the same amount of impact as the president that then picks the team and drives the team and says, hey, this is what I want to see. And if you look, if you listen back to a lot of the ideology of the previous Kennedys, right, right, you know, Rob, uh, not just Robert and his dad, but also John F. Kennedy, they pushed back against their own team because they felt so strongly about um, the ideology that they had, they pushed back against going into wars, even though they may have been, um, they've been surrounded by people that said, yes, we need to go to war. That's, I think, the most important thing, right? The, the leadership at the top, not just the millions that you don't see underneath the covers. Um, and when it comes to privacy, there is no choice. Fundamentally, I'm, I'm open to having someone challenge that. I don't believe there is a choice in the current election for president. If you want privacy and you want that in crypto, Kennedy's our only choice there. Thanks, Paul. Tap uh, protocol. I'm going to come back to you because we've had a number of conversations and I think what you're doing is super interesting. Um, but I know that Tyler has to go. And so I want to give Tyler um, the opportunity for a few closing words. Thanks for having me on. This has been a lot of fun and uh, particularly interesting to hear the non-US perspectives here. So uh, I think uh, for better or for worse, Bitcoin is only be going to become more and more of a hot button issue um, as we ramp into the election in November here. Um, and the last uh, call to action I'll, I'll leave is, um, you know, uh, particularly uh, working with the Trump campaign. If, uh, if anyone has ideas, <coughs> uh, wants to support a uh, PAC or other uh, movement kind of al aligned on helping shape some of the policy goals there, please hit me or David up and uh, we're all ears. Uh, we want to make this uh, as productive as we can for the Bitcoin industry. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so for the last few years, I think a lot of the people here on the space probably know this already. I've been working on um, building greater functionality for Bitcoin, bringing DeFi to Bitcoin, bringing smart contracts to, the, to Bitcoin um, through Sovereign, through Bitcoin rollups that you're currently developing. And the reason I do this is because, in my view, we don't truly get the ability to benefit from Bitcoin until we can use Bitcoin without any intermediaries. Almost all of the regulatory pressure that we've seen 
almost all of the ways that uh, uh, centralized parties, either through fraud or through government intervention, cause people to lose funds, have been because uh, we don't have enough decentralized layers around crypto generally, but specifically and most importantly around Bitcoin. Bitcoin, as a result, has been something that you can hold, uh, something that you can use as a store of value. But we haven't seen Bitcoin backed stablecoins develop around it. We haven't seen uh, transactional activity develop around it. And as a result, we haven't seen the kind of economy based on Bitcoin that could potentially develop if Bitcoin had greater functionality and utility. Uh, and so we need to build additional layers of technology that further decentralize uh, what we can do with our Bitcoin and allow us to use Bitcoin in more ways without ever having to go through an intermediary. One of the things that uh, TAP Protocol are working on, and I think TAP Protocol are an excellent example of this kind of work, is not just ordinals and NFTs, but <clears throat> the ability to bring um, other kinds of uh, tokens to Bitcoin and the ability for those tokens to potentially represent all kinds of things that people can transact in. So I want to come back to you, uh, TAP, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more of, you know, these additional um, advances that you're bringing or hoping to bring to Bitcoin. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Um, just a, a step a little bit back on the um, on the regulatory side of things. Since <clears throat> since we are located in Europe, um, totally agree. Um, the, uh, the, the regulations can apply pressure, but in our case, for example, um, we are we're lucky in terms of that we have um, like uh, fully fledged out uh, regulations um, that that will be. Um, uh, that will be uh, basically go go live in December this, of this year, uh, and and we are um, we are already open communication channels with uh, local regulators, and and it is at least here it is made in a way um, where you can say yeah that's acceptable that makes sense that's nothing uh, you except of a couple of examples that I found funny in the, uh, as as uh, the things that they suggested <coughs> a few years ago, but. Um, in general, I would say it's it's definitely possible if it's reasonable. Yeah. So, um, but um, uh, coming back to the main point, I mean, um, what what we're building here with the tap protocol. So the, the tap protocol is basically a, a multi asset protocol. Yeah, for for Bitcoin ordinance, and what that means is um, that it just not um, um, specifies, you know, like. Uh, uh, um, about um, how um, fungible uh, tokens um, are being, uh, you know, like uh, account uh, balanced for, but also uh, other kind kind of assets. So this is a prominent example uh, that we had just recently um, is the uh, the implementation of digital matter, um, which is uh, quite a success. And then this is um, there's in short uh, a way to to define assets, uh, fungibles and non fungibles. Uh, within the protocol that uh, that um, uh, that derive from um, from compute computed data that exists already on on, on the Bitcoin uh, on the Bitcoin chain, and um, you are not making arbitrary decisions there <clears throat> anymore. Let's say about the um, uh, the supply, for example, um, and what, what you're doing there is basically it's like like you're like you're like an archaeologist, you know, like uh, look for patterns in the history of, of Bitcoin and find. Um, that basically digital matter that that has a meaning, it has a potential meaning, a meaning, uh, and that you define your uh, that defines your your assets. Then basically, but that's just one aspect <clears throat> of that. Just an example of what the protocol is doing. Um, aside of that, there's of course like a few um, um, uh, few um, let's say let's call these hooks into the protocol that enables you uh, to do things like. Uh, um, uh, more de uh, decentralization in terms of um, when you want to hook into the protocol and, uh, can't, and can't, go. Sorry, I I want to I want to try and make this as real as the people who are list for the people who are listening as possible. And I think you know you're a developer, and so I'm going to try and help guide you a little bit to be slightly less technical. So one question I want to ask is, um, how does Tap Protocol bring things like staking? Swapping, liquidity pools, AMMs, in other words, trading and earning yield into the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah, uh, we are at the moment building a, uh, a new feature um, that's coming out in the next weeks. It's called Promises. Uh, we were talking about Promises earlier a lot, but 
Um, this is basically exactly this. And um, what it does is, um, that's why they're called promises. Uh, this is a way of, uh, um, of a kind of... Uh, New angle on computation on a, on Bitcoin L1 uh, that in, uh, enables DeFi um, basically, but in a way where you can can strictly say you get what you are promised, right? Um, which is uh, of, of course not always possible in uh, on, uh, on not always possible on other chains because the complexity of <clears throat> smart contract is really high and it takes ages to figure actually what's going on. There are, con um, there are contracts, for example, that are um, where, where the code is not <clears throat> where the code is not released and things like that. Um, we don't have that here. It's it's literally uh, embedded in the protocol, uh, which is open source, which everybody can can have a look on. And um, builders are basically uh, when 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 using these mechanics. Um, they, they are they are orchestrating, composing these based of these uh, based of these um, modularized parts, right? So, <clears throat> so what you would do is then basically you would hook into the tap protocol um, for these promises and achieve um, very similar results to uh, what you can achieve with smart contracts, especially in the DeFi <clears throat> in the DeFi in the DeFi field. Uh, except that it's not smart contracts. Yeah, I hope I could explain it a little bit more on a high level like this. Okay, so um, how much is it depending on intermediaries, like for example, oracles or um, uh, uh, trackers, right? Uh, in order to facilitate transactions for people or uh, is this entirely without intermediaries? Um, this can be done uh, entirely without intermediaries. Um, this is um, it's literally an L1 <coughs> solution. Um, we ourselves also um, have been providing a decentralized indexing solution uh, that comes with uh, these kind of meta protocols. Um, but you you don't have to use that. You could literally, like uh, based on the specs, <coughs> uh, index it uh, yourself, run that, yeah, uh, separately and independently um, from uh, from uh, from whoever uh, was doing that. It's literally. Um, embedded in the protocols about what the rules are supposed to be yeah, to make that happen. Uh, and aside from, from this uh, indexing necess necessity, uh, there is no third party uh, involved in that. So, and that means that literally, um, that literally anyone can participate that and it's peer to peer. So, um, the, the word says that. So, it's literally uh, nobody in the middle can affect that. Okay. So, we have to come to a close. And so, I want to give you time for one last question, right? Uh, and the question is, we're, this is the Bitcoin Alpha Show, what is some alpha you can give to listeners uh, right here, right now? What is uh, a way that they can use, track, and tap to uh, profit, to increase the amount of Bitcoin they have? Or what is the most exciting thing that you're excited about that's coming to tap over the next, say, month or two? Uh, yeah, I'm super excited uh, about, of course, um, promises itself. It's it's pretty big, and um, generally, I'm I'm also like super excited about things that you can do with this technology that you can only do there. Digital meta theory, uh, um, for example, is implemented uh, right into the protocol, um, and it's uh, it's only available. Uh, on on um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin digital meta, meta theory makes the most sense on Bitcoin, right? Uh, there's uh, literally no other chain that does that, yeah. And um, that's uh, that uh, derives from that are completely new asset classes, right? Where um, where nobody knows, you know, right now where they had it to, but it's super interesting. Uh, and um, right now we we're seeing, uh, for example, Blockrunner did that recently um, when they released um, something based on that with te with the tap uh, protocol technology. That's literally like kind of blowing off right now, yeah. And um, this can only be done with this. And 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 these are these these things, you know, when when you're creating something new, you um, and you're researching, you you identify. Uh, new things, new narratives, new opportunities, new uh, solutions to problems that you thought you wouldn't need, but they are there, right? Uh, and and um, and and that's super interesting, and that especially <clears throat> altogether something that plays out, um, especially in the uh, you said it next couple of months. Thank you. All right, we have to close up here. 
So I just want to say a few words in summary. I think what we're seeing right now is an extremely exciting moment. Uh, not only, as we just heard from uh, TAP, and we're seeing, you know, if you if you listen to the spaces, um, if you're just paying attention, what's happening in Bitcoin right now from a technological perspective is unprecedented. The amount of innovation, the amount of developers who are moving into the Bitcoin space, the ability to start building additional layers of decentralization and functionality on Bitcoin, we've never seen anything like this for Bitcoin before. It's basically like we're all early to Bitcoin again. But... Uh, when looking at what's happening in the overall world, we're also seeing something remarkable happen in the world, um, particularly in the United States, where for the first time, Bitcoin is being supported and debated as a major topic in the U.S. upcoming elections for Congress, for Senate, and even for the office of president. There's been at least three candidates already who have taken a very explicit pro-Bitcoin stance. Vivek, RFK, and most recently, one who is actually very likely to be elected, Trump. This has placed immense pressure on the other party, on the Democrats. It has already started to have an impact on the regulatory environment, and that changes the way that developers perceive the market and entrepreneurs perceive the market, it means that we get to work with less fear for ourselves, for our families, for the fact that we could be fined or even worse, go to prison. And so it's going to encourage a huge amount of innovation. It's also going to mean that a lot of people are going to feel much more comfortable about investing in this space. And more than anything, um, unfortunately, most people still look to their governments and look to their president to sort of authorize for them what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable, what is um, part of the mainstream and what isn't. And so from a, you know, if we thought that the symbolic value and the practical value of a country like El Salvador adopting Bitcoin was huge, what we're possibly standing at the precipice of is the United States of America effectively taking its first steps into adopting Bitcoin as well. The very country which currently owns the reserve currency in the world is anointing Bitcoin um, as, a, as a currency, as a tool that ordinary people can start to use with less fear to their lives. So we are, I think, in uncharted territory for Bitcoin. Uh, from a technological perspective, from a political perspective, and from a social cultural perspective. And um, so I wish all of you the most exciting bull run we've ever had, and I'll see you next week.